voice of Zoom. So welcome everybody. <clears throat> My name is Dan Kerr and I wear many hats at All Souls Church. And I'll uh, get to this hat a little bit later on in terms of uh, that particular hat that's on my head. <clears throat> so we welcome you to our monthly Second Saturdays poetry reading. People often ask- um, how, how do I hear him? Okay, I'm gonna have to mute somebody. Please keep your mic muted. Actually, I'm supposed to. Please everybody stay muted. We'll ask you to turn on your microphone when it's your turn to speak. We do want to include everybody, but we don't. <clears throat> it's not enhanced by a cacophony of noises. So we do this every, um, the second Saturday of every month. You can set your watch by it. And as I've commented many times, as I've commented many times, um, poets in the post-COVID environment or the COVID environment, depending upon your frame of reference, have become very punctual. It used to be that we did the poetry in the church at 11 o'clock and it would be 11.05, 11.10. The only people there would be <laughs> Kathy and myself. So it's great to see the poets uh, like Mahatma Gandhi said, you, know, you have to behave your way into a new way of thinking. Um, the, we do have, we're fortunate to have an excellent um, featured reader, but again, you're all invited to read one of your own poems. So if you'd like to uh, read in the open read, just put your name in chat and I will call upon, your, call upon you in the, the order that the names actually appear. Please keep your microphone muted. I don't mean to sound rude to anybody, but it really wreaks havoc when you've got blaring noise on your microphone. So I'm gonna keep everyone muted. And then when it's your turn to speak, you can then turn your microphone on. Um, feedback is a gift. So if you, uh, any feedback you might have on this session, we've been doing this for uh, quite some time now, but we are always learning and refining it. So if you have any suggestions, Daniel B. Kerr at verizon.net. And we will always, I get together regularly with, um, uh, with Richard and with Kathy, and we take a look at the feedback that we get. Planned agenda, <clears throat> planned. Life is what happens to us when we make plans. So we plan to go from 11 to 12. We may flex a little bit if we have, uh, depending upon how many people have to read. I think the latest we ever flexed was like 1220. Um, so we may, well, kind of, uh, depending upon how many, you'll get, a, you'll get a sense of how many people want to read when we get to the open read. So I'm going to make a few opening comments. I'll turn it over to the Poet Laureate. Uh, Dr. Richard Bronson, he'll introduce Marsha, then we'll do the open read, and then we'll bring Marsha back for, a, uh, for an encore, and then we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Bronson come in and give some concluding remarks and announce the next exciting speaker that we have um, in, um, in November. If I seem a little distracted here, people are entering the room late, and I have to personally admit them, so I've just admitted three more people to the room. So this, I talked about the various hats that I wear in this program. Uh, we have a, a All Souls Church, historical church in Stony Brook, up on the top of the hill uh, at the gateway to Stony Brook Village. We've been there since 1896. Uh, we have a very deep relationship with the community. So there are people who worship there on Sunday, uh, but <laughs> there's a, well, if you include people in nursing homes and little babies and stuff like that, we got about 90 people but we have a relationship with over 750 people in the community. Our doors are open every day. So just going around this little slide here, every day that the, uh, the doors are open, we collect food and that food goes to the St. Uh, Gerard Mejia Roman Catholic Church in Port Jefferson. They feed about 300 families. Uh, on the bottom left, we do concerts uh, once a month. In fact, we've got two graduate students, uh, a flutist and a guitarist uh, performing this evening in the church. You see the church is a beautiful venue for concerts has great acoustics as well. We also do Gregorian chant once a month. You recognize those two poets there, that's uh, Robert Savino and uh, Barbara Southern. That was the point where Robert passed the twig, uh, the sign of office of the poet laureate, fittingly enough, is a twig. <laughs> so we do the poetry once a month and we do two uh, interfaith things uh, every week. So every Tuesday we do an interfaith uh, morning prayer service. You'll recognize uh, one of the poets, uh, Rabbi, uh, uh, Fisher, who was, uh, we had him come in and he actually preached the gospel and gave a, gave a homily uh, on an Old Testament reading. Um, so it's the interfaith morning prayer service. We also do an interfaith rosary. There's a misperception out there that only Roman Catholics do the rosaries and that's not true. Greek Orthodox do the rosary, Anglicans do the rosary, um, Buddhists do the rosary, Muslims do the rosary. So we do the rosary. We do that every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, we also, the gentleman there with the drum is both a uh, Native American elder, uh, and he's also a chiropractor. That's Dr. Richard uh, Rick Stadler. We do the uh, Native American drumming once a month as well. 
And then in the middle, there's one event that we do, big event each year, which is the annual Souls for All Souls 5K Rice and 2K Walk. Those of you familiar with the church know is it at the top of the hill and there are people in the poetry community that cannot make it up those hills. So we've donated, uh, we've dedicated all funds that we raise from that annual race, uh, both in terms of sponsorships and people who run and people who walk, uh, we've dedicated that to make the church handicapped accessible. And I think as, as uh, I'm still tabulating the results, but after this past race, we've raised about $60,000 in that regard. And every year there is a group led by the then uh, poet laureate. So it was uh, Richard Bronson who led it this year the Live Poet Society, and they walk each year from this. So that's uh, on behalf of the All Souls community. It's a, uh, I, I have the pr privilege of welcoming you here. I'm really excited, number of folks that we have. And at this point, let me turn it over to Dr. Bronson. Dr. Bronson, over to you. Going to unmute? There you go. Okay, good, okay, well, first of all, welcome. You know, I always look forward to this second Saturday both in terms of the high quality of the poems and then the sharing of poetry, the sharing, which I think is so important in the camaraderie. Uh, what I've been doing the last few months <clears throat> for a while I continue to do is to pick a poem from uh, uh, what's called the Long Island Poetry Collective Flash, where twice a month we gather and uh, share poems that we like and, and value. Yeah, I've picked a poem by Theodore Retka, a seasoned poet, called The Waking. And I picked the poem for two reasons. First of all, it's a wonderful poem. In some way, it's like a Zen koan. So there's a puzzle to it. And it's in the form of Villanelle, a very special style or form of poetry. Uh, it takes a lot of skill to write one well. Uh, and uh, basically, it's a five stanzas of three lines each. So tercets, and then a quatrain of four at the end, there's a, there's a repeating pattern, which I'm not going to go into. So I'm going to read it now, The, uh, the Waking by Theodore Retka. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I feel my fate and what I cannot fear. <clears throat> I learn by going where I have to go. We think by feeling what is there to know. I hear my being dance from ear to ear. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Of those so close beside me, which are you? God bless the ground. I shall walk softly there and learn by going where I have to go. Light takes the tree, but who can tell us how? The lonely worm climbs up a winding stair. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Great nature has another thing to do to you and me. So take the lively air and lovely learn by going where to go. This shaking keeps me steady, I should know. What falls away is always and is near. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I learn by going where I have to go. Well, you can figure that out. But you know, it's one of my special poems, and and, and and this flash is very nice because we choose poems that are in the literature, and then discuss them and their meaning, what they mean to us. So anyway, with that, I would like to <coughs> move on and to uh, welcome Marsha Nelson, <coughs> uh, our featured reader today, and uh, <coughs> Marsha's a playwright and a, a poet. Her poetry has appeared in numerous uh, literary anthologies, including the NCPLS Review, PPA Literary Review, Lauren Quarterly, Poets on Mac Bard's Annual, and The Long Islander. In her poem, I Thought It Was Love, won the Nassau uh, County Poet Laureate Society Award of 2016. She was born in Trinidad and Tobago, and she loves traveling and new, meeting new interesting people. And we were talking ahead of time, she's an animal lover with Five, I think it's more than five cats in there actually. And she owns and operates Love and Pooches and uh, Pals Noble Dog Grooming. And I welcome her to the uh, podium and look forward to hear her wonderful poetry. Thank you for being with us, uh, Marsha. Appreciate your coming. Marcia, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bronson. Thank you. 
Thanks for the introduction. And thanks to Danielle and Kathy for inviting me. I'm gonna go straight into it. And so I don't go over time. Okay, my first poem is called Gift Bearers. I wrote this after uh, I visited San Francisco at Dan Frank's um, workshop and came out with this. Trees of the earth's endless effort to speak to the listening heaven, Rabindranath Tagore. In the short confluence of time, heaven kissing earth, they leave discarded vestiges of themselves, progenitors of a past, rooted firmly in soil rich with their flesh and bones. We stand erect, bearers of the gift, on the shards of light, vermilion, apricot skies, pennyworth, California poppies, succulents and wildflowers scent the velvet night air of surf and salt. Our branches extend as we pirouette into a kindred dance of syntax, cleverly crafted words. <clears throat> and my second is called In the Wait, as we wait for a new season where we went in from summer into fall, and now we're in between winter, which I do not look forward to. <laughs> in the wait, the sky is that beautiful old parchment in which the sun and moon keeps their diary, Alfred Hebel. It's in the early morning when quiet whispers a silence so big, I hear only with my spirit. When summer has slipped through the back door like my petulant Maltese Heidi, eager to scout her backyard for intruders, grazing my leg in stormy retreat. The earth sweeps its sad goodbyes of fallen leaves, vestiges of blossoming trees and dewdrops on lilies. A world of jade morphs then shimmers into a kaleidoscope of rustic auburn, scarlet, fawn, and primrose. The universe is playing another round of symphony as daylight winds back. Tulips retreat into a cocoon of darkness ready for a frosted nap. A squirrel steals bits of brown paper strewn haphazardly by the wind in my backyard. He scampers up my pine tree, which stands defiantly against winter's ability to strip life from limbs and leaves. It surrenders a few dead pine needles grudgingly as the squirrel continues to build its nest. We wait for the snow and ice to inevit inevitably bite back. And we know it will. <laughs> the third one is called, Give Me My Flowers Now So I Can Smell Them. This is dedicated to Lynn Cohen. Lynn was my mentor. Um, I first met her in Hofstra. Um, she was my professor. She introduced me to Dan Frank and Cliff Blydner. And that's how I got involved with performance poets of Long Island. When Diane told me you were in the hospital, I was worried. Cancer, a stroke from hematoma had caused you to fall outside of a restaurant. I walk into North Shore's hospital, gripped in trepidation, holding onto a bouquet of pale pink salmon roses. A petite East Indian nurse is giving you your meds, a bitter pill, hard to swallow. The pleasant male nurse, a Trinidadian, is helping the lady in the next bed. He comes over to me quickly. You can't bring live flowers or plants on this ward. He takes the roses, swears they're not real. <laughs> Amused, I tell him to smell them. He's pleasantly surprised. Smiling, he locks them in the closet. Promises to give them to your daughter when she visits. The petite nurse asks if I'm with the family and I say yes. 
She's my mentor. She asks you if you know me and you're suddenly lucid. Oh, Masha, I'm dying. The words hit me, douses me in ice cold water. The intake nurse at the front desk worries that the roses will die in the dark closet. No one will remember them there. She tells me to take them. On my drive home, I pledge to stop and smell the flowers more, withholding nothing, hugs and kisses, confessions and affirmations. Give me my flowers now so I can smell them. Okay, so I'm gonna read from my 2017 book published by Dan Frank. It's called Night Visions. And the first poem from that, I'm gonna read it. It's called, There is Purpose in the Pain. <clears throat> Grief can be the garden of compassion. If you keep your heart open through everything, your pain becomes your greatest ally in your life's search for love and wisdom. Rumi, you have so much more to write, she said to me. Yes, I know, I answered. But sometimes the sword gets heavy in my hand, the veil of tears thick in my eyelashes. We humans have a propensity to shut down when grief is too much for words. Bitter roots, remorseful roots, insecure roots, bittersweet aftertaste of misery poured from desolate hearts. We bottle up pain, collecting the essence of strange flowers, keeping them close to our embittered hearts, unaware that heartbreaks of gold nuggets to be stored in life's fork. At the ripe old age of wisdom, will we learn that our pain has given birth to our purpose. Thank you. A raven or a dove. On the cusp of transformation, Warm days melt into chilly nights. Death plunders my apple blossoms and majestic trees shed their glory. Each day brings a new giant, friend or foe. <laughs> Sometimes you never know. The drum beats louder, harder, the steady percussion of one heart to another. I listen for the trumpet's clarion call to wake me up. We must all wake up. I'm dreaming of flood waters again, an eternal flow that chills my soul. A steady stream of night visions make my bone tremble. Huge wall of water. We were always threatened by waters. Even Noah had a way of escape. Thanks. And my next one from this book, the last one I'm gonna read from this book is called A Man from Galilee. I wrote this poem when I visited, after I visited Israel, because it took a while for me to write this, to really you know, soak up everything that I was seeing and feeling and hearing. I, I remember when I first got there that first night, I just got a poem, it just came to me, boom, and I just wrote it. Those are poems I like, I really like those poems. But this, this, this I took my time with. A man from Galilee, tranquility, deep, calm, and still, water rising like spun gold on a lonely pier. Breakfast on sky deck, my face pressed to the glass. Sunlight rests on my eyelids, splashes the nearby dock of Caesar Hotel in Galilee. I am collecting early morning expectations, divine connections on this sick, sacred journey, Ephe ephemeral yet abiding heart to heart, a bouquet of baby's breath, violets, rose petals and calla lilies, 
the cherished gift of a lover. A million times and more, I've longed to walk where you walked, from the plains of the Jezreel Valley and Acre to the Mediterranean shore. These hills, rocks, and dirt have felt the warmth of your feet, listened to the passion in your voice, and with witnessed your miracles. You are the bread of heaven now. Watching from my balcony, I search for a trace of your presence among the restless streets below. Colorful lights pierce the night, music everywhere, a mystic melody. Van Morrison belts out of his soul into the mystic and moon dance. <laughs> I want to dance in the moonlight on a magical night, silver specks of moon dust in my hair as I dip my toe into the water's edge. Rap, rock, and reggae are wrestling like immortal foes. In a tavern beneath, a young woman plays a guitar. Her plaintive voice floats up and wraps itself around my balcony. Thank you. And that's the last one from this book. Now I'm gonna read my more recent poems, you know, when we went into the, into the pandemic, <laughs> a lot of things happened and we started questioning it and asking ourselves questions, you know? So the question I was asking was, are these the last days? So this poem is called, these are the last days. <laughs> the tide is in, in our veins, yet we still mirror the stars, Robinson Jeffers, continents end. The hours hurdle us forward like rockets in the stratosphere. Time says, I cannot wait for the loafers, street urchins, or hood rats, for the white color criminals, the patriots, and the protesters. We're all hastening towards calamity. Are these the last days of hours spent standing on food lines that snake around corners, bare shells gaping back at us, second guessing our existence in the midst of a pandemic, shortages of medical supplies and building equipment. The unemployed grow impatient, worried about stimulus checks that never arrive. We feel the tide in our veins, the pull of a force of reckoning. Yet we look towards the heavens. Thank you. And the next poem is called, Let Them Eat Cake. And also that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, now yet, nor yet the works he had done for Israel. Judges 2 and 10. Our world is passing away. She has slipped into a coma induced by sorcerers who pit white against black, gay against straight, right against left in a cauldron of hate. The hand is ticking on the time bomb of a revolution a dark winter approaching. The pundits push an order out of chaos philosophy. We are subject to madmen and they rage against the God of creation. 1% at the top, the order of the pyramid. Elites want to rule the world. They build elaborate bunkers and silos with grains, feed us GMOs and fake franken foods while people catch COVID in the ghettos and die under a chemical laced sky. <laughs> and they rage against the God of creation. President Trump gets called bunker bitch. As the citizens riot outside the White House, he calls in the military to disperse the mob with rubber bullets and tear gas proceeds to a small church across the street to hold the holy writ upside down in a misguided photo op. And 
they rage against the God of creation. Thank you. So my last poem is called When the Glory Comes. If you look in the background, you see three ladies, just three of many, you know, that were killed. And um, I believe one of them, Brianna, she, that happened um, somewhere amidst the pandemic. The other two were before, if I'm not mistaken, she, you know, everything happened. So I'll read it when the glory comes. Their faces stare into the, the distance crafted by the skillful strokes of the artist Nina Pascal. She, unable to voice her emotional distress, takes charcoal, graphite, and pastel in hand. Her lines soft and strong as she contours, shades, and blends her frustration into faces of social consciousness. A Tatiana, Brianna, Ayana, African American princesses in different seasons of their young lives tied to the same cord of ethnicity, a matrix of suffering that dates back to slavery, a painful period in our history. A Tatiana, pride and joy of her family, graduated college with a degree in biology. She sold pharmaceutical equipment to fund her medical studies. On a wellness check, shut through a window by an officer. Brianna, surrounded by the wrong people in the hood. The night the officers raided her apartment, she was not the intended target, but she died in a hail of bullets, the result of a no-knock warrant. Ayana, the youngest, with dimpled grin, loved playing with her dolls, playing with her cousin. She was asleep on her grandmother's couch when a SWAT team through a flashbang that burned her blanket. Then an officer shot her in the neck. All three slain by the bullets of those who swore to protect and serve. Their lives mattered. Their black bodies mattered. Now they wait in glory for their celestial bodies. And it won't matter because there will be no color. Thank you. Thank and you, that's Marcia. it for now. That's it for now. Marcia, that was outstanding on just so many, so many so many different levels. Um, you know, I can I can feel those trees and flowers in San Francisco. <laughs> Your description about the, the 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 change in weather and waiting for the snow and the ice oh, to hide us. <laughs> I can smell those those flowers in the room when you went to see your friend, the purpose and oh. Oh. the floodwaters, you know, the biblical references, very mystical. And the man from Galilee, as you looked out the, peered out the window, um, mm -hmm. the last days of the, of the, of the pandemic and the mm. let them eat cake, very powerful and that beautiful tribute to the African-American princess. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Very moving. Very moving. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to bringing you back for an encore. Thanks. So, I look forward to it. So uh, I'm going to mute everybody. So when you come back for an encore, you're going to have to put your mic back on. OK. I'm going to mute you now. Let me share the screen. OK. So we are going into the open read now. Um, and here is uh, the references. We talked about biblical references. So Moses is <laughs> Pretty good spokesperson here. So um, <laughs> we're going to pick up the names uh, in the order they appear on chat, and I will announce the poets in three uh, groups of three. So you won't be surprised if you were not able to navigate chat. Uh, don't worry, we're very inclusive here. We'll go around at the end, and between Kathy and Richard and all the other watchful eyes here, we'll make sure everyone that wants to read get a chance to read. But let's start with the people whose names appear in chat. Please keep your microphone muted um, because again, the background noise can be quite distraction. Please wait to be called upon to read. <laughs> and after we, um, we, we finish with the open read that uh, will bring um, Marsha back for an encore and then uh, uh, the poet laureate Richard Bronson will close the program. 
Uh, and we'll see. We'll, um, we've got, uh, oh, three, six, nine. We got about 10 readers. And usually there are a few others that appear when we get to the end of the readers. So, so we'll see how we go. You know, we'll schedule the gulp close at 12. But my guess is we'll probably go a little bit after 12. Okay. So we're going to go in this order. And I'm going to mute and make sure everyone is muted now. Let's just see here, participants. Okay. And the first person, groups of three. We're going to start with, um, it's, it comes in as two names and I'm not sure this is right. The person on their screen, it says Ann and Jane, Jamie, and then Mike, uh, Mike from North Carolina and then Judy. So the person known at least in their screen as Ann and Jamie, I don't know, it doesn't look like it Ann, so <laughs> you're on. Okay, you gotta turn your mic on, Ann and Jamie. You had it on, then you turned it off. Turn it back on, please. There you go. Um, it's Ann and Jamie because uh, I am uh, pre Y2K when it takes to, comes to any of this stuff and uh, she's good enough to take care of me, put up with me. I've been waiting eight, I've been waiting 18 months to read this poem. Watch out, Judy. Here's Judy. She lives to write, writes to live, loves to laugh. Partial to purple, resplendently dressed, she outlines arabesque thought balloons, keeps them afloat, rearranges them at will. A force of nature, she doesn't force things, she lets life come to her, but I would not call her patient. She has so much to do. When she's in a room, the room comes to her. A friend to many, She's a friend of mine. She unravels mysteries, then moves on. She has so much to do, so little time. She refuses to be deterred. Here's Judy. What you see is what you get. That's her way. Sit back, relax. Let's hear what she has to say. Thank you. Great job capturing uh, Judy with all her colors and all her many talents. It's amazing how many people she connects with her energy. So thank you for that. And now we go on to one of our North Carolina poets, Mike Daly. Good morning, all. Clear? Clear as a bell. <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, you know me, I'm gonna go a little lighter than most people do. A little bit about Halloween because I'm not going to be here on Halloween and I wanted to share it anyway. Goblins, scarecrows, kids in sheets, knocking on my door for treats, begging for unhealthy sweets. I guess it's Halloween when the moon can be seen and betwixt and between a shadowy figure floats by and the kids hear the scream from something unseen and they fear it's a wild banshee's cry. You act surprised as the kids in disguise go to door to door on your street. You hand out M&Ms to each ghoul and his friends when they call out to you trick or treat. And then late at night, when they've turned out their light, the real monster finally strikes. While the kids are all sleeping into their room, it's creeping to steal all the candy it likes. And the moral of the story, perhaps in allegory, disregarding everything that's said, it comes out Halloween and often leaves unseen that not all monsters live under their bed. Thank you. Well done, Mike, well done. And um, beware of that banshee. <laughs> so, okay, uh, Judy, with all her multicolors. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Marsha. And oh my, thank you, Jamie. So now I have tears in my eyes. Oh. So I have, um, I actually have a new poem. Um, I was, um, I zoomed to Worcester, um, England the other day. I was corrected, it's Worcester. You have to, sounds like a, uh, like a sneeze, but. So I was in Worcester and their theme was magic. So right before I logged on, I put this together and it kind of fits here, so magic. What else to call it? We're here together, yet 
3,347 miles apart, Worcester to East Meadow, US to UK, 5,380 kilometers away from each other, but it's magic. I can put my palm to my screen, you reach out and we nearly touch hands. No hugs, no handshakes, no cheek to cheek greetings, yet there you are in your Zoom box beside me in mine. And who could believe there is a great pond between us? If we were to meet, we'd need to book a flight, pack a bag, get to the airport, fly about 13 hours, drive a bit, to be in person together. Personally, I like this just fine. Space travel, magic stardust encased in software we don't see or hear whirring and work, no blips or beeps and few if any glitches to keep us smiling at one another, zooming to share the craft of poetry. Time travel, mystical, magical tour that depletes no sleep for many of us, no night day differential to upset our breakfast, lunch, dinner day, no stay up, go to bed, set the alarm so we don't miss a verse. 7 p.m., you've had dinner, daylight fading to soft twilight, looking forward to an evening of poetry spent with friends. 2 p.m., just past the lunch I skipped and hours to go before my evening arrives, a class to teach tonight at 7 when you will be snuggled down in dreams of poetry, when I will be leading a class and thinking of you when I open with, let poetry take you anywhere in the world. Magic, pure magic. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for the magic you created there and the magic you can create every day. Okay, our uh, next group of three would be our, another North Carolina uh, poet, James Horn, and then Herb, and then Rabbi Fisher. So let's start with uh, James Horn, uh, James. Okay, James. this is one of my older poems I wrote now. It's about uh, Robin Williams. It says, it may change time to time and in constant flight of the fact, of the fact we should never ever lose sight, that God is true and for us, his huge help is here. Believe in and always know he is close and near. Many times God himself, I so often will ask, why am I weary and behind a mental mask, trying to hide true self and me that you made? How often love so simply to sit in the shade. My life is over and done, which was much fun. I am a memory for my fans who won't forget me and free at last in heaven, a better place to be where again someday you can laugh along with me. Jim Horn. Thank you, James, for that wonderful tribute to Robin Williams. So I think of our poets marching, of course, the Dead Poets Society was the inspiration for the Live Poets Society. <laughs> so thank you for that. Herb, over to you. Okay, uh, you can hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, very good. I wrote this on my wife and my 42nd wedding anniversary, October 20, uh, 2020. She passed away from cancer on All Souls Day, November 2nd, 2020. Return from hospital for it, please. The last time that I saw you without clothes, your self had shrunken prunishly. Your skin was hanging loosely off your bones the way your clothes began to do. I think of how I tried to brush your wildly tangled hair. It was as tangled as your cancerous self. Now home, I look up to our bureau top and see your spongy, smiling plastic poop. I look down to the floor. What do I see? Your fluffy, extra soft, pink teddy bear looks up to me with pursed lips blankly. I take down and up these toys of yours. The fluffy extra soft pink teddy bear I'm holding close to my warm belly while the spongy smiling plastic poop soothes more each time I squeeze. 
I'll save your candy in our drawer of all our snacks and socks. You will return from hospital for it, won't you? Thank you. Beautiful, moving tribute, Herb. Thank you. So many levels. Mm -hmm. Hi, my Fisher, over to you. Adam, you gotta turn your mic on. There you go. Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, this uh, deals with another uh, sad situation. Uh, 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 it's uh, uh, following her, but I think this is uh, uh, not terribly, terribly different. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it, it deals with uh, the. Uh, the, the pain and uh, I think the unnecessarily uh, unnes uh, the, 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 the un unnecessary war. A letter from Kabul. A woman receives a letter from Kabul. We've just been through a big battle. Maybe you heard about it on the news. We lost men, which is very sad. But I am okay, not really injured, just a few scratches. I can't wait to see you. I hope to get through this in one piece so we can have the life we planned. A week later, she receives a telegram. We regret. Thank you, Adam. Very, very powerful. Been far too many of those telegrams. Okay, next group of three is Bruce, followed by Dan Kerr, and followed by Shu. So, Bruce Johnson, over to you. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Marsha, for reading, and Dan and Kathy and Richard. It's great to uh, be here on these Saturdays. This is uh, because of the time of year, I thought this would be appropriate. It's called School Supplies at the Five and Ten. Downtown they go, mom and the boy on the evening of the first day of school. He has the list, and as they walk past the registers, lines already long with schoolmates and parents, he spies the stacks of loose leaf paper packages, blue cloth covered ring binders, boxes of pencils and pens, reinforced subject dividers with colored plastic tabs, assignment pads, and 80 page composition notebooks with black and white marbled cardboard covers. Yes, he needs them all, these tokens of possibility. And he has a good supply of good intentions. This year he will not fall behind. This year he'll do all that is assigned. This year he will get high grades and gold stars. But the high hopes of September give way by November under the weight of piles of Mad Magazine and DC Comics. Ambition is abandoned and the three ring binder sits idle in the corner of the den. Television, bicycles and baseballs take their places above writing and math and reading in his hierarchy of needs. Next year, he will return to the five and 10 and stand once more in the school supply aisle, newly full of plans and expectations because it is September. And as far as he knows, September will always come again. Thank you. Well done, Bruce. I think every student can identify with that and anyone who's ever taught can identify with that as well. So. Okay, it's my turn. And this is a poem, which I did read once before a couple of years ago, but given when I saw Marsha was, uh, had come to the United States from Trinidad and Tobago, it made me think of my beloved Anne Elvira who came to the United States from, from Bermuda. And this poem is called Bermuda Potatoes. I was the straw that broke my mother's back, a big house in Huntington Bay, and eight kids was too much for my mom to handle. Ann Elvira left her family and the soft apartheid of 1950s Bermuda to change diapers and cook and clean for a large family on Long Island. She arrived in the US as an immigrant with little education and went on to complete high school 
become a US citizen, graduate from college and become a senior administrator at Stony Brook University. One day long ago, I refused as a child to eat potatoes. Ann Elvira told me firmly, these are not just potatoes, Daniel. These are Bermuda potatoes. From that point on, Elvira only served Bermuda potatoes. Elvira introduced me to Aesop's fables and the wisdom of the Bible as she understood it. She would always say, you don't have to love your brothers and sisters. You don't have to like your brothers and sisters. You just have to love them. Your mother named you Daniel. Always have the courage of the Daniel in the Bible to speak truth to power. Although she was very black, it never occurred to me as a child that Elvira was not my mother's sister. The realities of race and racism were learned outside of my home. And I began to refer to Elvira as my black aunt. During the summer, she often teased my sisters. She said, girls, I'll always have a better tan than you. Whenever turkey was served for dinner, she always said, the dark meat is the more flavorful. Later in life, as Elvira introduced me to her friends and family, she would always say, this is my son, Daniel, the white sheep of the family. <laughs> Although Elvira was loved in our home, she was not exempt from the long arm of racism on Long Island. She left my parents' employ when I was six, but returned to live with us when she could not rent an apartment. She'd say, I called the number to confirm the apartment was still available. And then when I arrived, the landlord said, it was no longer available. Elvira's proper British accent opened the door and her black skin slammed it in her face. Whenever I hear someone say, white privilege is a myth, I think of the pain of my Aunt Elvira. In Bermuda, they have a tradition when someone dies, the person closest to the deceits, deceased reads their biography at, her, at their funeral. When her family asked me to perform this special task, they reminded me I was to read only what was written. At the church in Hamilton, I followed the script until I came to the last line. And the line written for me said she came to America for a better life. I edited and made America a better place for everyone she touched. After the funeral, the family gave me a picture. I'm looking at it now. And a young Alvira is looking at me with a big smile on her face. A few weeks ago, I changed the picture frame and discovered why she was smiling so broadly. I recognized her handwriting on the back of the picture. It says, US citizen, February 2nd, 1962, Riverhead, New York, Elvira Vanderbilt. Thank you. Okay, Shu, we're over to you. So you have to mute your mic. Yeah, I did. So I posted my poem in the chat area so everyone can read it just in case. It seems my internet is not very stable today. Um, the title of the poem, Seasons. Spring without you was colder than winter. Huh. Ground without a cover of snow make in the freezing air, soaked in the cold rain, loneliness grew. Summer's hot sun could not defrost the frozen heart. I was burned. Rose withered in droughtness, left behind stone covered stamps, hard and sharp. Autumn's indifference wind Thunder away the, the leaves. Rip tomato rot in the earth. The tree of loneliness born a fruit, dark and bitter. Winter silent the world under the innocent snow. Standing that loneliness tree, waiting. The end. Thank you. Beautiful, show. Beautiful. It's a, it's a nice. Um... Nice compliment, very, uh, very well to the poem that was read earlier by Marsha about the change in season. Well done. Okay, now the only one I have on the list, and we'll, we'll go around and make sure everyone gets a chance. We have Emily Sue. Emily, over to you. 
Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Marsha, and all the uh, open mic readers. Um, I have a change of season poem also called The Handoff. <clears throat> Fresh starts run alongside summer's easy breezes for the handoff as the first fallen leaves paint mottled designs on grassy canvas. Roses keep the sun celebration alive while corn husk scarecrows shoo black birds off browning fields. Fall fairs bring out crafts and crowds shuffling along in a chattering stream, dogs and babies in tow. Baseball builds up to the season finale while golfers and beach bums treasure, cherish each warm day, knowing it may be the last. Yellow school buses make their afternoon rounds, setting kids free to chase the dwindling light, summer still clinging to their skin. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, beautiful. My wife Sue and I went to Montauk yesterday and it was a beautiful day, but you could feel the coolness in the air and I was reminded uh, with all these poems about the change in weather. I think it was F. Scott Fitzgerald of the Great Gatsby that said that life seems to begin again with the advent of the crisp fall air. So. Okay, so let's uh, go around the group. I'm looking at everyone's picture and Kathy, uh, please help here and Richard, please help. Is there anyone who wants to read who hasn't had a chance to read? Okay, Sharon, so you gotta come off mute. And then I see Sandy, Sandy as well. So Sharon, go ahead. I have the old Halloween one here. It's called The Long Strange Candy Hunt. And actually it's written by me and my brother's dog, Otis. I do not like this time of year when leafies fill the street. They crunch beneath my footies and the acorns hurt my feet. They dress me in weird sweaters, but my tail still gets so cold. My bones are freezing out there. Don't they know I'm getting old? And then comes late October when my young one starts to dance, imagining how I would look in sequined disco pants. With big blonde wig, sunglasses too, and beads around my neck, we head off on our never ending candy hunting trek. The other young ones run around dressed as strange as I. A short one dressed as Yoda tries to poke me in the eye. I really hate the princesses. I'm like their holy grail. They scream and run to pet me and then pull me by my tail. The bag gets filled with candy, but there's nothing there for me. We run so fast, we pass up every tree where I could pee. A lobster in a stroller sticks wet candy in my fur. And everyone gets mad at me when I respond with Grr. We get back home, my wig has slipped, the, my leg is caught in beads. My pants are riding low, the hems collecting mud and weeds. My young one's witchy hat is tossed, her candy all poured out. And now she'll just ignore me, so I wander off to pout. I jump up on the couch and snuggle in to have a nap when I smell something yummy and I feel a little tap. My witchy one before me is offering a treat, my favorite liver cookie made with real dead chicken meat. <clears throat> I guess this season's not so bad, but very soon I know they'll start to make me tinkle outside in the Christmas snow. Well done, Sharon. Thanks. Great celebration of Halloween and then looking through our four eyes of our four legged friends. Okay, so I think I saw, let me go back to the gallery view. I think I saw, I was it Sandy wanted to read. Sandy, if you come off mute. Sandy, you gotta put your microphone on. There you go. Okay. Go on, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> so many talented voices. Thank you, everybody. I have a memory from summer. Waves. Waves and waves of waves bombard the beach, caress the beach in endless youth, ageless age, while I watch hypnotized, mesmerized by the power, hour upon hour, of towering surf repenting return, the ebb, the flow, leading me to believe, if not know, this pure devotion 
to boundless ocean of babes in arms, bikini charms, teasing brothers, doting dads, mothers, grams and gramps, flirtatious others, amid jumping, spraying, diving, swimming, shouting, praying, all this caring chaos congregating in awe will last, keep us free unto eternity. Beautiful, Sandy, thank you. Okay, anyone else in the gallery? Kathy, you're on. Hello, everyone again. I want to thank Marsha, take this opportunity. Um, you are a force, Marsha, in the, in the poetry world, that is for sure. And uh, Dan, you're doing a great job emceeing. Thank you for that. And Richard, thank you for being our uh, poet laureate representative and, and partial MC as well. Um, the voices I hear, you know, it's just so inspiring. It just turns every event of the day into something to look at and appreciate. It's um, poetry is just a wonderful thing. I think everyone here agrees. I wrote this um, poem called Art. Um, it was an experience I had traveling to the West Coast, and it goes like this. Watching the sculptor teach his pupil where to cut, where to shave. After a while, he just gives a look. The film in the Seattle Museum of American Indian Christian White skips to the final product, and I am in awe. I will never create such a work of art. Feeling a twinge, I realize it's not the wooden sculpture that I am taken with. It's the look understood between two people, no longer needing words. They're just knowing and finishing an original idea together as one. Beautiful, Kathy. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I think everyone has had a chance. Is that Cherry with her hand up? Go ahead, Cherry. You gotta come off mute. Hi, thank you. <laughs> um, Daniel, Kathy, Richard, uh, Marsha, uh, what you know, I love your poem, When the Glory Comes, and I do anything to hear you read. You're such an influence. And um, I'm just uh, blessed to hear everyone's creative vulnerability today. Um, just really enjoyed hearing all your poems. Um, I'm going to read uh, Be the Heroes. Be the Heroes. My sexy muse has a voice of an angel, saunters, circles those hips, stares into my soul, makes hair on my arms stand with lyrics executed in tones, setting my heart to cry. As crying befell when Capitol officers testified about insurrection death marking inflicted in horror on their four heroic souls, four of hundreds of others, they, we, Weep and weep. As poets, lyricists, artists try to comprehend, navigate the murk of how we got here, try to shift the weight of it all from siloed canoes where masks come down and all that's left is nakedness of circumstance. When a winter darkness tries to play at mind tricks, drag us, except we've been here before. We can dance this gig, play trumpets out windows, ring bells at seven, wait to hear the latest tolls while heroes heal, cry, say goodbye, as some of them die. And that is the tragedy even Shakespeare didn't portray. Yet here we drift astray. Can we just not portray heroes today? What do you do when a loved one won't or can't vaccinate? In morn's quiet, these tears riot in all the places helplessness knocks on this door. Knowing purpose must push, paint these cheeks with a rosy blush, let lanterns illuminate passage to heal earthly pains with freedom's brush because we've been here before. Can't let the boats tip, plug the holes, lift the sails, sharks swirl, tempt, retreat, heart, Thank goodness, still beat. Yes, we can dance this gig again. Voice, hopeful light in, a chance to reimagine. Find a new sexy muse. Be the heroes 
heroes need us to be. Thank you. Beautiful, Sherry, capturing the times. It's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so I let's go back to the view. I think uh, Kate Kelly has joined us. Kate, we're kind of at the end of the open read. So if you want to read, Kate, just um, not to put you on the spot, but if you want to read, just come off mute. You're welcome. And while Kate decides of whether she wants to read, I'll look around the room and see if there's anyone else that we haven't gotten to. Okay. So Kate, give you one more opportunity. And Melva, you're welcome if you'd like as well. I think we've heard from everybody else. Okay. So if there's no one else, Marsha, why don't we come back to you for an encore, please? Got to turn your mic on, Marsha. Okay, go ahead, Marsha, you got to unmute your mic. There you go. I'm unmuted, okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna read for the encore, this poem. It's um, from my first book, which I self-published years ago. It's called, Why Must I Drink From This Cup? Chosen before the foundation of this world, in a place where I'm face to face with destiny. When you see acts of kindness, love and humanity, you see me, born forth from a space that you cannot measure, separated by time and the third realm, I hold the treasure, eternity. I must love this body of which I have your mind, acquainted with grief, surrounded by murder, hatred, and deceit. Why must I drink from this cup? A gift precious in the sight of so few, narrow is the road taken by those born anew, marked by misunderstanding. I feel the pain of the broken, the blood that cries out to me, the cry of the unborn baby, the fatherless, the beaten, suicidal and depressed. Why must I drink from this cup? These burdens so too heavy, yet I carried them to Calvary accused, ridiculed, scorned, and slain. But it's all in the plan with many souls to gain. Now the trumpets sound, listen. Break up the fallow ground, prepare your hearts for the seals are being broken. The four horsemen must ride. So be cleansed of every sin, mainly pride. Get the sleep out of your eyes, awake from slumber. The first seal reveals a white horse. On it rides the conqueror. The second seal, a red horse, with the one who has the power to take the peace. The killing continues to increase in the streets, in the schools. Husbands killing wives with the unborn, wives killing the unborn and the newborn. Fratricide, matricide, infanticide, suicide hedonistic, terroristic. The third seal, a black horse. The rider holds the balances with famine in diverse places, Ethiopia, Somalia, India, and Indonesia. The fourth seal, a pale horse. On it rides death with the power to kill the last part of the earth. Wars, weapons of mass destruction, poisoned water, plagues, attacks on nature, sea, land, and animals. The fifth seal, and the slain cries out, how much longer, Lord? The sixth seal breaks with the heavens stretching above and beyond. The moon and stars tingling shall be shaken. What we shall see will not be mistaken a black sun, blood red moon. The heavens shall depart like a scroll. Herein is the dark night of the soul. Grown men shall tremble in fear, but God's servants shall be sealed and protected, I hear. When the seventh seal is open, voices, thunders, lightning, a great earthquake, and the seven angels prepare to sound great 
and terrible things to abound. This is why I must drink from this cup. Thank you. Beautiful, Marsha. Yes, this poem, this poem I do with <laughs> all my props and everything <laughs> and music in the background. <laughs> I can do it here. So. Very but, eloquent, uh, eloquent reminder that, you know, the Christians believe that, um, you know, Jesus, the incarnation of God, but that he was a man. So, okay. So I think we've, um, at this point, I think everyone has had it. I think I'm going to give Kate Kelly one more chance because I said she came in late. Kate? Okay. Okay. Dr. Bronson, over to you then for our for a close and the announcement of the next poet. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Marcia, for sharing your wonderful poems with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks you know, for having me. And the last poem is you were reading, reminded me of the lithograph by the German artist Alvik Durer of the Four, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. You know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. It's a wonderful poems. And thank you, everyone. The poems are just so intense and beautiful today. They're always good. These were exceptionally strong. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we said before, I always look forward to the second Saturday for the quality and the, the sharing and the camaraderie. So anyway, it gives me great pleasure to uh, let you know who will be uh, <laughs> with us uh, next month. You know, Virginia Walker, an interesting poet, received a PhD in British and American literature from NYU, has taught uh, writing and literature, has basically also written on uh, spe speculative fiction and the, the work of Octavia Butler, uh, has <coughs> been a, a art, uh, acting as a facilitator uh, in round tables at Shelter Island, and has had poems basically published uh, in many different journals, and we look forward to seeing her on November 13th. It'll be interesting to, to hear her poetry and her, her style, a different background. We look forward to seeing everyone and welcome everyone in the other month to the second Saturday uh, poetry. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you.